come up with like broad general strategies for the international solar market and we provided these strategies for the government, for the users and for the private sectors. So what we want from the government is really to design solar power support scheme to have certainty and continuity. And we want more transparency, accountability, encourage competition. And the government needs to be more strategic about an industrial framework. How solar can benefit our local industries mm. and maybe expand solar community opportunities. For the private sector, they need to lobby more effectively, obviously, to compete with uh, other renewable energy sources and coal and nuclear. And they need to be more engaged in effective consumer education campaigns. Um, in Thailand, we don't have a installer certification system, which is really important. And if the government doesn't do it, so we think that the private sector has a role to create like a third party installer um, certification. That's important because if you have many kinds of installers, some of them do a bad job, then you can create really bad image for solar. If it does a bad job, connects the wire the wrong, the wrong way, you get fired, and that damages the image of solar forever. For end user, we encourage innovation in PV applications, like solar water heater, solar water pumping system, for example, to make it low cost and locally available. Um, these are the details that I want to go over with detailed policy and regulatory recommendations. Uh, so finally, in terms of output, we got um, a report, the roadmap. In English, which you can find on this website. So it looks something like this, the actual roadmap. And um, we have many briefing papers on handbook in Thai and some briefing papers in English and we can make papers published and some newspaper articles as well in English. And you can look at and check out from this website. Um, in terms of the outcome that we got, because we created this um, solar roadmap process as a platform for people to engage in it, so we were able to aggregate gather voices. In the past, people just complain, like uh, the private sector, they just complain about government policy, but we allow them to complain in a very systematic way so that we can provide recommendations for the government. Um, and in the process, we enable a network and research network of digital collaboration as well. So um, the way solar policy and many other policies and tasks has been made is more top down. You may understand from the context of China. But now, now that we have a platform, then we could aggregate those voices to be heard about more in a systematic way. Um, but there's still a lot of work to do. For example, we need to push it more to inspire future initiatives. Um, we need to mobilize a wider global constitu constituency, especially the consumers who didn't have much to say in the process. And then the impact on the power grid is still unknown. Will you please still use this as an excuse not to allow solar to enter the grid? And the government or the public in general do not really have like a vision on the benefit that we want to be materialized from solar. In China, you already see the benefits materialized in terms of manufacturing, we becoming the world manufacturing leader, that kind of thing. Um, this is just the website. In the process, we use about posts and stickers to do the quantification of the barriers and benefits. Um, and so just a little note on how we get there. We, in the background, we decided to have a research platform, a uh, policy deliberation platform in terms of the seminars and workshop and then the public outreach. Um, for the research platform, we try to divide the complex issues because solar policy or any kind of energy policy really we have to divide into key areas such as technical integration to the grid, economics, analysis, business, and policy. And then we try to engage the experts to do briefing papers so that briefing papers ideally can be used as a basis uh, for everyone to be on the same page and 
generate discussion. And we try to embed data collection in the stakeholder participation process through survey forms. And ideally, if we keep going and we have more funding, then we'll try to create research champions in each area. Because we really need to have experts from different areas like technical, economic, policy. So this is the way we divided the working groups. Um, the experts are engaged by coming to present or writing briefing papers, and we try to identify the different centers so that they can uh, be active in this process. In the policy deliberation platform, because people are diverse, they are the experts who I mentioned can help design the strategies for the roadmap. They could help write paper or become speakers in the working groups. So for example, when we invite the uh, utilities to be the speakers, then over time, even though in the beginning, in the first workshop, then really anti-solar, and toward the end of the second year, they're more friendly to solar power because they're more engaged and they start to hear people's comments. Um, and the government officials, of course, to be engaged. Um, we created an advisory committee so that we can get buy-in from them, we get consultation from them that what they're doing is okay. Um, general public, they can participate in the workshop, but as I mentioned, that most are private companies who want to come because they, they don't want to miss the train, they want to know what's going on, and they want to make sure that they don't miss any policy, any policy that will come out. So these are the pictures. Um, we also have this tool called Flickr that allow people to vote in real time, get data analysis. Uh, so thank you. Any questions? Thanks, uh, Dr. Tong Su-Kui, for the very great uh, presentation of what's happening in the um, Now, may I request questions or comments? What do you think of the role of government, and in particular, it gets in, uh, in this um, a renewable energy development in Thailand? Um, EGAT in the past has been a passive player in terms of renewables um, because the um, main core business is based on investment in large scale fossil based development. But over time, they have become more and more active. Um, first, through their subsidiary, because they have a subsidiary that is a private company that is investing more in wind and solar. So, for example, that subsidiary is investing in wind by 640 million miles to be imported to Thailand. And they also have to, they have their own uh, renewable energy policy target. So, they view this as a way to understand renewables more. Because in the past, they were familiar fossil fuels. But in order to understand renewables more, they have their own projects. They have their own target of renewables. And recently they got a mandate from the government that um, that they have to be able to uh, receive more renewables in a stable form. Meaning that the government in the past saw renewable as intermittent and unreliable. But with the advent of energy storage, they want to experiment on it so that they can combine energy storage with wind, energy storage with biomass, so that he can, as a purchaser of electricity, have to design a scheme to receive its diverse sources more. So the raw he can, that's the, what they do, but they could do more in terms of r and in terms of trying to absorb renewables and finding a way of balancing different sources. Now, questions or comments? So, um, I can comment uh, some slides that I didn't include much in the situation in Thailand is that we, in terms of the large scale solar installations, is competitive with uh, buying electricity from natural gas plants. Especially in 40 past now. 
So we're talking about changing the scene from being tired in the past that has resulted in growth that you saw to a competitive bidding similar to what has been happening across the world in order to get like low cost solar. And for commercial rooftop, it's more expensive, yes. But factories, commercial buildings in Thailand now are interested in investing in solar because they provide a saving and the rate uh, payback period for them is only seven years, seven to eight years, and they can generate electricity at a price that competitive is buying from right now. So the utilities in Thailand, the distribution utilities, uh, similar to the C LP, C LP, they are adjusting. They are studying how they can adapt to the environment where solar power is eating their income. So that they see the future now that their revenue will decline because the factories and commercial scale will not they want to adopt solar for their family. And uh, recently we had like a big university with a large rooftop that adopt 15 megawatt solar to make it become like a sick largest university campus in the world to have solar. So I think the plan is unstoppable in Thailand. I think the lack are maybe the, uh, the households which do not know much about what's going on. But in general, if you ask them about solar, they are quite positive. I mean, they want to buy it. It's just that the upfront cost is still high and they may need some kind of stimulation. That's the fitting tariff now uh, offered to the resident, or is only restricted to relative large scale installation in the industrial plant? Okay, I forgot to mention the current policy. Uh, we only had rooftop feeding tariff for the past two years, and then the government ended it. So, in the past, during those two years, we had like an allocation of 100 megawatt quota for people or rooftop to subscribe to it. So it covers everything up until one megawatt, one megawatt size. And people can make a lot of money from that, actually. And after they stop it, because they realize they don't want to subsidize solar power no more, and instead, um, because of the cost has been declining. So we kind of see that solar is entering self-consumption era, where everyone generates and consumes it first, and then if that access to electricity then it's back to the grid. But then the policy and regula regulation design around that is also complicated. Mm -hmm. Meaning that uh, they can design it to stop people from doing it. Or they can design it so that they can encourage people to do so more. So examples in the US is that they have the classic rendering where people consume first and access when we close to it and they get com compensated in the term in the form of credit to the electricity bills. And that really is affecting the utilities at a large scale. We more and more people do that. Uh, the utilities lose their revenue. And in China they launched just launched a pilot project this past month, allowing people for, for doing that that they don't compensate for the excess electricity. So it's a Total nonsense, so it's like donating electricity to the power grid, and then the, that electricity, the, the utility gets to sell to, to other people. Mm -hmm. But then they're, they're looking to modify the innovation. still doing this high equity research, we are always mention about, let's say, privacy man. I just wonder if there is any list of companies in Thailand who has stake in uh, uh, solar PV and areas. People who have a stake? Yeah, uh, list of companies. I mean, big corps or list of companies. List of companies? Right. Okay, so we have diverse list of companies based in Thailand, based uh, in China. In Thailand. Okay. Really diverse companies, lots of companies actually have just been growing. So there are like the investors who just give the money and then there are the developers who develop projects um, and uh, give the seed fund and then the EPC contractors. You see the higher and higher number of EPC contractors because it's easy to enter this business. But with different qualities and there's 
housing companies. Um, so really diverse landscape in watching creating jobs as well. But if the policy is inconsistent, some of the companies go bankrupt and people exit to enter other sectors. Mm -hmm. I can answer that gentleman's question. Um, uh, for one of the biggest uh, power company uh, in, in Thailand, they actually invest heavily in, in renewable, but not in Thailand. So they are a Thai company, but they invest in, in Japan, in China, um, but uh, in, in Thailand itself, they develop a lot of uh, coal, uh, coal power. And uh, I have actually heard some friends who are in um, the renewable sector, they mentioned that a lot of Thai companies, they are ready to invest in renewables, but the projects in Thailand are not sufficient enough, so instead they invest elsewhere for renewables. Is that, is that the, the, the case that you see? Yeah, because of policy uncertainty. So the support comes out in a lot. You know, like uh, the solar farm has a quota, the rooftop FIT that I mentioned had only a 100 megawatt quota. So for a company to want to build portfolio, it's not that much at all. They may want like uh, a few hundred megawatt in a portfolio, for example. So actually, like she mentioned, Thai companies go invest in Japan because of the attractive bidding trade. So the government really have to have like what we recommend, like a consistent and continuous policy that we around allow the private sector to plan and move forward. Sorry, just one question I would like to know in Thailand, the utility is a uh, is a stay on business or is already totally uh, privatized? Um, it's half privatized, so for the generation sector we have the state owned BGAT, which owns fifty percent, maybe less now, fifty percent generation plastic. And then EGAP also owns trans transmission system all over the country. Uh, and then the other fifty percent generation comes from independent power producers, IDPs, SPP, VSP. We still have some time to discuss. We have not done so. So well, okay. So you keep mentioning like the consistency of the government implementation of policies. So like, um, what do you think is the main barrier for the government to implement such a policy? Because you, you see that it's a, there's a quantitative analysis talking about the benefits of PV systems. So why the government still like, um, like um, put it behind? Like um, what is their attitude? And, is it because of the like the, the power companies, uh, the, ben the benefits of power companies, and the negotiation between power companies and government? Is it a scenario? So, uh, the government and the utilities maybe think differently. The government, as a policy maker, they do not currently see the benefits of solar PV. Uh, all of the benefits, and they don't see how the benefits can really translate. So basically, they just see that PV is an important technology, even though it has more benefits like carbon emission reduction. Carbon emission reduction is not really big in Thailand, meaning that what you see as the board as a top board, it comes from, I would say, educated uh, consumers. But actually, we got a comment from the stakeholder that if you go out and ask the general public, you may not have carbon emission reduction as a cognitive right? And also, as mentioned that in, in one of the scenarios, we could try to make it not just like a power policy, but an industrial policy. So if they try to push it so that we have more information in solar PV, then you get benefits from it. If they try to push it that, so that we have more manufacturing plants, then you get jobs benefits from it. So it's a lack of ambition for the benefits that we can get from solar PV policy. And also for the utilities, it's different because um, maybe the business is crucial, they use fossil fuels, and also the fact that 
then lose. They have to lose because uh, the more that people generate power from solar, the solar power meets demand. Then it reduces the need for them to build more power plants, and their profit is tied to the investment in new power plants. So that's a conflict of interest against renewables there. So you can see this for all renewable power actually that uh, in the past two years, EGAT has blocked renewable power facilities from interconnecting to the grid because claiming that the grid doesn't have the capacity to absorb renewables. Then in fact, the, the analysis behind that is really in the black box. Nobody sees it. But I think it's the same for utilities everywhere around the world. Um, I think uh, Thailand actually has a lot of potential because you guys have a lot of beautiful islands. So instead of um, relying on coal power in these beautiful islands, there are a lot of potentials on, on, on renewables. And, um, and about uh, carbon reduction, I'm just curious if Thailand is, uh, it has, it has taken part of um, the COP21 and how are they planning to meet the, the, the target? Yes, um, we have uh, the so-called INDC report already. Uh, based on our existing energy plans, we can achieve uh, a certain target already. <laughs> but it may, may not be ambitious, but they, they stated a certain target, which I don't remember exactly. 20% decline by this year. But in our, um, since we are planning to diversify away from natural gas for our renewables and take coal, that helps a little bit. Combine that with a plan in the future for our grid system. Is that a question? May I have a question? Um, I think um, uh, it's the, the role of the residential center seems to be, um, I think, uh, quite important for the um, Thai solar future because right now um, you have quite a negative amount of jobs for a special people like that. Then on the other hand, we see that they are saying what you show in the slide, Italy, they do have to have a uh, great substantial amount of solar people from the residential center. So there is a huge difference in the way how residential sector perform in different countries. And then, what do you see are the most critical factors affecting these very different um, PV performance in the residential sector? And then, um, what is the tariff um, system in China and is it related to it in some way? So what are the main factors that are affecting their yes, central remarkable differences in the residential performance in the solar wind across these countries? Yeah. And Karen, so, um, I think for these countries that get a lot of residential solar the green here, they have been in tariff. So Germany really started out with a lot of being in tariff strong, but then they increase it over time as the market expands. And Italy also had really strong bidding tariff. Um, UK had a bidding tariff and they also had like innovative business models where a third party comes in to install solar roof on your rooftop for free. You get to consume the electricity and they get a bidding tariff, mm -hmm. something like that. So over time, yeah, it's, it's, it's the bidding tariff that keep off. But right now, in many countries, they're also facing it out due to the cost of solar power has been coming down. So in Thailand, if you have a big tariff, the government says no. And it also makes sense because we don't want people to be addicted. In Singapore, they never had a subsidy. Mm -hmm. They really say no to subsidy. So um, it's more based on like, consumer awareness and innovation from the business sector. Mm -hmm. um, and also government policy to procure from tendering. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one big factor, one major driver. But in an age where there's no feeding tariff, we need to rely on consumer awareness. We need to rely on maybe another form of incentive that reduces uh, 
a front car, you need a power subsidy. Uh, you may need, um, need a well-designed and mirror recognition because when the residents are not solar, they may not be able to use it all the time, right? So there'll be excess electricity flowing to the grid for sure. You have to do something with that electricity in a very clean and transparent and uh, incentivized way, like engineering. Adoption is also important. It is easy to adopt. You don't have to deal with the utilities too much. You don't have to uh, apply and go through the long process of committing. That also helps, for example, in Germany, they can just send email to the utility and the utility can connect the system. Whereas in Thailand in the past, um, even with the feeding tariff, people went to get in line at the utility since 3 in the morning. <laughs> they still do like application like paper based. So that makes it really difficult. Oh, and also innovative models from the private sector also helps a lot. Which is what uh, kicked off solar power in the US. In the past, they didn't have much residential production either, but Solar City came in with the solar PPA and solar leasing model. So the consumer pays zero for the cost, but they pay monthly installments, I'd say 100 US dollars per month. 